Okay, so in the last video we saw how uh, we can use uh, Lamo precession to implement an arbitrary uh, single qubit gate on a on a spin. Um, it turns out this is not the this is not a really practical way of implementing a quantum gate because because the the B field required for this is is very large and. Uh, it's difficult in the lab to actually um, it, to to move this field to change its direction rapidly as we want for for quantum gates. Um, so it turns out that there's a there's a different way of of implementing single qubit quantum gates um, uh, due to an effect called spin resonance, which gives much finer control, and that's what I'll sketch out in this video. Now. Of course, um, uh, to actually understand this well would require considerably more time than we have available uh, in this lecture. And so um, what I'll do is I'll just sketch this out for you. And um, um, you should follow it at whatever level you can. And so, so this is, you know, just think of this video as being, um, as being material that you can understand at whatever level you find comfortable, and if it's too advanced for you, just you can skip it. Okay, so so let's see what you know. How do we think about spin resonance? So let's let's do as our first step. Um, so let's think of, of it as a two-step process. Let's let's think of the first step as what we did earlier, which is we turn on a large. DC field B naught. Okay, so so let's say B naught is pointing in the in the Z direction. And so what what happens when you turn on this large DC field? So well you had initially we had B naught equal to zero. And let's see what what did that mean? Well spin up and spin down states now have both have the same energy level. What happens when you turn on the when when you make B naught non-zero is that you split this energy level into two parts. So you have the spin up and you have spin down, which corresponds to zero and one. And the energy splitting between these is just h bar omega naught which is h bar e b over m. I guess, so, so what, we are, what we are saying is omega naught, which is, which is also the Lamo frequency, omega l, is e b over m. Okay, so, all right. Um, the reason I'm calling this omega naught is it goes with the, with the b field b naught. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to turn on a, a small AC field. So, so now we turn on a small AC field. B1 cosine omega naught t. So, so notice that this is, a, this is an oscillating field which oscillates at exactly the Lamo frequency. It oscillates at exactly the frequency at which this the spin is precessing due to B naught, but this is pointing in the x direction. And so, so now, wh what does this look like? Well, well, you see, B naught is pointing in the z direction. That's B naught, and B one points. You know, there's B1 cosine omega naught t, so it's this oscillating field which which points in the in this, you know, in the that's the x direction. And so what, what that means is that our field actually goes from there to there, oscillates back like that. So essentially our our field is just wiggling back and forth. A little bit like that. Okay. All right. So, 
So now what's the effect of this AC field? Well, what it does is that it induces spin flips. So it induces a mixing between, between 0 and 1, between the up and down flips. So it induces this controlled mixing between uh, 0 and 1. Okay. So let's see, you know, let me write down what, what actually happens quantitatively. So we saw the Lamo frequency omega naught is E B naught over M. Sorry, this B I wrote before was B naught. There's there's another frequency omega one, which is E B one over two M. So notice there's a factor of two here. This is also called the Ravi frequency omega R. Okay, so now if, if psi at time zero, the state of the qubit is cosine theta over two zero plus e to the i phi sine theta over two one, then the evolution of this qubit under the DC field plus this oscillating, you know, this small AC field is this. So psi of t is cosine of theta plus omega 1 t over 2 plus e to the i phi plus omega naught t sine theta plus omega 1 t over 2 1. Okay, let's see. What, what, what does this mean? Well, what it means is, if you remember back to our picture on the block sphere, so this was the z direction, that's y, that's x. And we had a spin that was, that we, we said, well, you know, it was precessing if this was, you know, the, the angle theta, Right, so this was angle theta, and and phi, you know, the change in phi, this omega naught made it made it precess like this. But now, what's happening is, in addition to precessing like this at a at a fixed angle theta, now theta itself is changing, and it's changing because of this Rabi oscillations, you know, at frequency omega one, which is you know omega sub r. And so, so theta itself changes. So what, what happens is, as it's going along, it, it starts moving, spiraling down, right? Because as, it's, as phi is changing at this, at this frequency omega naught, also theta is changing at the frequency omega one. Now, actually, omega naught is usually very large. It's in, you know, you should think of it as large. It's in the gigahertz range. Whereas omega one is can be quite small, it can be just in the kilohertz range. Okay. Now, if you actually want to create a spin flip, so if you actually want to flip the spin, what you would do is you would choose a pulse. So, so in other words, we would keep the DC field on, B0, B0 we just keep switched on, that's just constant. And every time we want to perform a gate, what we would do is we'd actually turn on the small AC field, right? And how long should we turn it on? Well, if we want a, uh, an actual spin flip, then we want omega 1t to be, to be pi. So how long should we switch it on? Well, we should switch it on for a time delta t such that omega 1 delta t is equal to pi. Okay, so now let me just, um, you know, as I said, the actual calculations, you know, to, to actually solve this to, you know, we could, we could sort of write down our Hamiltonian and figure out, well, uh, solve Schrodinger's equation and, and see that, that in fact, 
this is what we get as our solution to Schrodinger's equation with the with the new Hamiltonian, where we are saying how does the how does the spin actually couple to this to this field, which consists not not only of the time invariant component, you know, of this this particular field, but also this time varying component. But what I'll show you is a is a is a way to think about this intuitively. Okay, so so the way we'll think about this intuitively is. Well, first we, we realize, of course, that when we turn on the, the DC field, B0, it causes the spin to precess, and it precesses at the Larmor frequency. But now, if we want to take away this effect of the precession, what we can do is we can, we can watch the spin in a rotating frame. So if we rotate along with the spin at this Larmor frequency, then it'll seem to us as though the spin is stationary, right? Okay, so that's what we are going to do. We are going to watch it in this rotating frame. And now it's as though this, ex you know, this DC field ceases to exist in this rotating frame. Its, its effects cease to exist. And now we want to just understand what about the effect of this AC field in this rotating frame? So what does it look like? Okay, so, so I'm going to give you sort of an intuitive picture of what that looks like. All right, so, so now that we are, we are watching in, so we want to understand what's the effect of B1 cosine omega naught t in the x direction. What, what's the effect of this, of this AC field when we are watching the spin in this rotating frame? Okay, all right, so you know, let's, let's just look at our xy plane. And, okay, so what, what, does, this, what does this AC field look like? Well, it, it basically goes like this, right? So, so at, you know, at any given time, it's, um, its magnitude changes between 1 and minus 1. You know, it, it, it starts at 1, it goes down to 0, it, it goes off to plus 1, and so on. Well, one way to achieve this effect is by actually considering two counter-rotating fields, each of magnitude B1 divided by 2. If you have both of these fields acting simultaneously, spinning at, at a rate omega naught t, right, making an angle omega naught t, then the sum of these two, well, the, the y component will cancel out and you, you would get exactly b1 cosine omega t. Okay, but now notice something. We are sitting in a rotating frame. The frame is rotating at, at, at exactly this rate omega naught t. So one of, these, one of these components is actually rotating along with us. So when we are looking at it in the rotating frame, it's going to look completely stationary to us. So it'll look in our rotating frame as though this is actually pointing in the x direction, whereas the other component is going to be rotating relative to us at twice the frequency. Now, because it's rotating relative to us, sometimes it pushes in the spin in one direction, sometimes in another direction, and this effect completely cancels out. And so this is why it's, you know, the effect of this AC field, when we look at it in our rotating frame, is as though there's an effective field of, which is constant, which is, which is constant, and it's of magnitude B1 over 2, pointing in the, in the x direction. Okay, so this is the effective magnetic field in our rotating frame. Okay, but now what's, what does this do to the, to this, to the spin? Well, we, we already saw what, what happens when we turn on a, a constant magnetic field. What happens to the spin? Well, it's, it precesses. It precesses at what? The Larmo frequency. Well, what's the Larmo frequency? It's, it's E times, E times, B1 over 2, 
divided by m. And so this is omega 1. This is, this is the frequency, this is the fre rate at which the spin is going to precess about the x-axis. But remember, we were, we were already in a rotating frame where we were, we were precessing about the z-axis at the Larmor frequency, omega naught, which was E B naught over M. Okay, so the net effect is we have both of these rotations taking place. So we have these Ravi oscillations, which take place at, at this frequency. And, and notice there's this factor of two because precisely because only, you know, the, the, the oscillating field we decomposed and only, only half of it really is, is moving along with us and the other half is rotating quickly relative to us and its effects cancel out. Okay. All right, so this is, um, you know, that's an intuitive explanation and of course you can, you can work all this out and, you know, uh, that, that takes a little bit of doing, but, but we are going to skip that. All right, now let me also very briefly touch upon how we actually implement two qubit gates, right? After all, for quantum computing, single qubit gates are not sufficient. But of course, if you have single qubit gates and you can implement any two qubit gate, you get a universal family and that's, that's sort of good enough. So in fact, let me just show you how, how we get an entangled state of two spins. Okay, so what, what we want to do is we want to create an interaction between these two spins. Okay, and so we want to, we want, you know, a two particle Hamiltonian. And the way we get this is by putting two electrons sort of next to each other where they can feel each other's presence. So now how do they feel each other's presence? You see, each of these electrons has some spin pointing in some direction. Okay, so you have electron number one, you know, so, so you have the two electrons sitting, sitting next to each other and they, they, have, they have their spin. Now, how do they feel each other's presence? Well, you see, the, the spin has this associated magnetic moment because it's like a spinning charge and each one feels the magnetic moment of the other one. Okay? And this is the interaction between these two spins. And so the claim is that the ground state of these two spins sitting next to each other and feeling each other's presence is the ground state is actually the a bell state it's it's the state psi minus which is 1 over square root 2 0 1 minus 1 0 okay what do i mean by this this means well let's let's write it this way it's 1 over square root 2 spin up spin down minus Spin down, spin up. Where, of course, this this is the state of the of the first qubit, for the first electron, the second electron, first electron, second electron. Okay. This state is called the singlet state. It has total spin equal to equal to zero, and this is really the the you know this is the state of electrons in a covalent bond. Right. You. You know, they 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 end up in this in this kind of a state, which is uh, this is this is the this is the Bell state, which is rotationally invariant with respect to all rotations, not just real rotations. In terms of uh, you know, in terms of if you if you were actually to write out the Hamiltonian of this system, you just get you know because you know these two spins feel each other. It's it's going to be some. It's going to be of the form some constant times the spin of uh, of the first um, electron 
inner product uh, spin of the second electron. But again, you know, that's not the point. I, I don't want to get into the details here. This was just to give you an idea about how you actually create two qubit gates. And of course, somehow what, what uh, or how you create entanglement between, between different spins.